Home stretch of the first day of the ILU, the first ILU. So I know everyone's itching to take off the thinking caps and put whatever cap you put on to go to Bourbon Street or whatnot. <laughs> one of those silly Jester caps. Or something. Don't take it off yet because we're getting ready to play trivia. And I know everyone loves to play trivia. And if you don't love to play trivia, you, you at least love fantastic prizes. And that's what you're in the running for. And I guarantee you're all going to want one of these prizes. So listen up. Pay attention. Here's your first opportunity. Go ahead. Mobile trivia challenge. Okay, next. First question. Who is the largest cell phone service provider? Sir. Verizon. Verizon. Anybody else? AT&T? I was going to say AT&T. AT&T. Anybody else? T-Mobile. T-Mobile. Carrier. Sprint. 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 Well, I'm going to get here in my bag of goodies. Who was the first? You actually, you were the uh, people I can tell they're already familiar with these guys. So you answered first, so you were the brave soul. Oh, there's no, I didn't have the pin pulled for the screen. All right, real prize, real prize. Uh, you get to choose between an iHome docking station for some sort of device with speaker, or $15 an app store gift certificate. I'll take $15. Don't spend it all in one place. Actually, you do have to spend it all in one place. Apple's got it going on, man. Yeah, China Mobile with 600 million users, so that's, that's pretty telling. I'm not sure what it tells. Um, I just like saying that after figures like that, it makes it seem like it's some sort of insight. I guess it means that uh, there's a lot of people in China with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have several opportunities to play trivia um, this afternoon, but, oh, by the way, um, hello again, I'm Brandon Andrews. This is my partner in crime, Dean Fouquet. We are founders of NextLearn, and we have been creating um, e-learning, most of which has some sort of simulation component to it for the last 17 years. And during those 17 years, we've managed to create um, literally thousands of hours of, of simulation. So to age ourselves a little bit more, and there's a couple of us in the room, too, that shared this memory with me. We actually deliver our first simulation on a floppy disk. So it was the small floppy disk, not the big ones. We're not quite that one. But it was a small floppy disk. And then after that, it was primarily CD-ROMs and the internet, and then the intranet, I'm sorry, then the intranet, then the internet. And now it's uh, 2012, and we have yet another deployment option at our fingertips, and that option is mobile, or mobile options, depending upon your point of view. It was probably about, I'd say, six or seven years ago we first started discussing the uh, potential of developing simulations for mobile devices. At the time, it was only phones. Uh, it was four or five years ago that we actually started putting some R&D effort behind a few of those ideas. And it wasn't until a year and a half ago that we got our first paying gig uh, from a client to develop out one of these ideas. So, just relatively speaking, from our experience, the adoption of mobile devices as a platform for um, immersive learning simulations has been relatively slow. Um, slow compared to the other emerging technologies that we've had the opportunity to live through and develop for. Um, I'd also characterize it as awkward. Um, it's just been the relationship between mobile and um, simulations has been awkward. And I think that there's probably a lot of culprits for this awkwardness, but I would narrow it down to one primary suspect. And I think it's the student's expectation of what learning should be on a mobile device compared to what they think learning is within an immersive learning simulation. When you talk about learning on mobile devices, you throw around terms like just in time, augmentation. We'll talk about immersive learning simulations, exploratory, learn by doing, risk-free environment, scheduled learning session. So even the, you know, the, the vernacular, I mean, you can tell from the terms, they're just two ideas that don't necessarily always play together well. Right? So what we're going to go do today is we're actually going to talk about a way that you can deliver simulations on mobile devices and not only overcome that awkwardness, but actually leverage some of the 
I think the best aspects of both technologies. And that idea, <clears throat> each one of these should be familiar to you because I know I've heard in several sessions, each of them talked about individually, micro-learning simulations, which are really just a subset of our learning simulations, deliver on mobile devices, to leverage the power of space learning. So we're going to talk about this concept, this equation in each one of the individual components. And after we've discussed it and we have a general understanding of how they play well together, then we're going to actually teach you how to create a micro-learning simulation. And once we've done that, we're going to open up a traditional learning simulation that was created in a way that allows us to pull micro-learning simulations out of it. So we're going to pull those out together, and then Dean is actually going to publish that to an iPad. Okay? So we'll do all that this afternoon. So, first things first, what is this equation here? Micro-learning simulations on mobile devices that leverage space learning. <clears throat> we'll discuss each one of these components individually, like I said, to get an understanding. But first, let me walk you through a fictional morning in the not-so-distant future. There's a sales rep, and she's flying to a sales meeting somewhere across the country. She uh, pulls her iPad out of the seat pocket in front of her, and she launches a five-minute simulation that her HR department has requested that she take sometime during the week. Well, she's on a flight, so why not take it right now? Now, this five-minute simulation is very, very similar to a simulation, an hour-long simulation, that she took two weeks ago. Now, by her engaging once again in the same subject matter and the same style of the immersive learning simulation, she reactivates and she refreshes that newfound knowledge. She embeds it deeper. She drives the retention home. Meanwhile, below her, a manager is on his morning commute via the train. Uh, it might be noted that a couple weeks ago during a traditional learning event, this manager, it was, it was found out that he lacked a couple of critical financial skills skills that were necessary for him to conduct, to do his job appropriately. So he receives a beep on his phone. The beep tells him that he has an email. The email's from his training department. It's a link to three three-minute simulations. Now these three three-minute simulations target the specific financial skills in which it was found that he was deficient. So he's on the train. He has a week to do it, but it's convenient right now. But we'll go ahead and take it right now. Meanwhile, across town, <clears throat> Excuse me. Across town at a law firm, uh, a young attorney receives a similar beep on her phone. Now she's linked to a three-minute simulation also. Her three-minute <coughs> simulation, though, is very, very similar to a three-minute simulation that she took two weeks ago. And that simulation was just before a day-long off-site training event that dealt with um, tax law. So she takes the simulation once again and it not only refreshes and reactivates her knowledge on tax law but it also gives her training department some very valuable information her performance prior to the offsite one day tax law event to her performance after so they're able to see how successful they were with that event so these are just three use cases that i hope begin to illustrate the uh this concept this this equation of these three terms that we know a lot about but maybe we haven't combined all right. Oh, yet another opportunity to win a fabulous prize. I'm just like I feel the excitement in the air. All right. How many apps are there on the Apple App Store? Oh, and this is the you serve. A million. Two billion. Two billion? My goodness. You are ambitious. Are you said five hundred thousand? Yeah. One dollar. One dollar lower, <laughs> 425,000, but this, I made this slide four months ago, maybe? And since then, as of, I saw it yesterday, actually, Apple was touting that they have 500,000 apps. So, oh, man, all right, reaching into the magic bag of goodies. You can choose from the iHome docking station for a mobile device, okay. or blue headphones. High quality, <laughs> high quality blue headphones. These aren't just the. Uh, yeah. I'll take the docking station. You got the docking station. There you go. All right. And for the contestant who uh, who guessed 11 billion or whatever it was. <laughs> All right, you ready? You ready to catch? I have absolutely no Super Bowl ability. Well, everybody's watching. You got to dive. All right. Okay, so like I 
Yes, uh, let's, let's break this equation down into the three components. Somebody stole your monkey? <laughs> oh, and it's not a monkey, by the way. In this group, it's a simian. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm out. It's horrible. All right, so let's break this equation down to the individual two parts, okay? Micro learning simulations, which I explained, is a subset of immersive learning simulations. And given what this conference, the subject matter, is about, I hope that uh, you know what an immersive learning simulation is. And if you don't by now, You've got tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> anyway, micro-learning simulations are a subset of simulations, and, and I know we all know, but let's just let's talk about it briefly so we're all on the same page. And also, I said earlier that we're going to take a simulation, we're going to carve out some micro-learning simulations. We'll use that as a, to familiarize ourselves with that simulation as we kind of talk about what these are. So micro-learning simulations, there's a lot of simulations out there. You know, there's war strategy simulators, poker simulators, flight simulators, you name it. It's out in the real world, it's probably being simulated somewhere else. We're talking about immersive learning simulations. So there are some, some key differentiators that, that make them uh, immersive learning simulations. We're going to take a look at an example. We're going to take a look at a couple of interactions. And then we're going to step back and we're going to discuss what it is exactly that we've seen, okay? And like I said, this is the simulation we'll be using to pull the micro-learning simulations out. Even though it is difficult to make precise business We're getting some coach, some guidance. We tend to be open Keep in mind, we're throwing our... you in the middle of the simulation. There's been a lot of backstory. Karen, Ralph Alpini and Howard Rafa explain that such overconfidence <coughs> in estimating leads to an extremely narrow range of possibilities. Subsequently, we either miss opportunities or expose ourselves to greater risk. To avoid the over... Worst case scenario? Well... I'd say we need to have a 40 to 50 percent increase in the reaction to the agent here. We need the software to make it easier to make callers through the system more efficiently. And as long as we're talking worst case scenario, I guess adding a few more employees would be helpful so that we can spread the workload around. You thank Karen for her input. After considering your options, you decide to keep the current software in place and agree to monitor the call volume closely. Two months after the new product launch, your department experiences a rise in customer calls. The circumstances prompt you to recruit Tony's team for assistance. While walking through the garden patio, you find Karen and Tony in the middle of an intense discussion during lunch. Look, Tony, I know your group is having a hard time dealing with all the customer calls that are coming in, but we are all overworked. I've worked every day for the last two weeks. I'm fried, and my group has been right there with me. There is no way I can ask them to continue handling your overflow. I'm glad you're here. With the skyrocketing call volume lately, my team's working overtime just to keep up. We've adjusted our software to run at full capacity, but our call wait time is over four minutes. And now Tony says his team is too busy to help There's out. There's probably a lot of developers here. So this is the curse to me. I'm sorry, I've got a comment on this. When we were creating this and we were getting feedback from the client and they were getting feedback, we got a bunch of comments that that was an ugly banana. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the type of comments you have to deal with sometimes. I mean, it's a great force to get the banana. Was I find something. I'm sorry. That <laughs> Okay, the student has an opportunity to interact. After they interact, we get some feedback going forward. We'll get some agent feedback. I think that's a great decision. The extra help. Some interactions, the gal will walk out, the, 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 the coach guy will do some feedback also. Appreciate the opportunity okay. to catch up on the Like I said, okay, let's step back and let's talk about what it is that we've seen. Well, we saw a couple of points in the simulation where the student, we have the opportunity to interact. After that, we saw the simulation react, react according to our interaction. Um, keep in mind, too, this is the branch and scenario flavor of immersive learning simulations. Keep that in mind. We call the point in the simulations where the student has the opportunity to interact, we call those decision point stages, just so we're all using the same terms. Where the simulation reacts, we call those agent response stages. So really, in its most basic form, the branch and scenario form of immersive learning simulations is a sequence. It's a procession of these decision point stages followed by agent response stages, and so on and so on. And then when you branch out, 
and you write every possible path that you want your students to explore and learn from, you can see why the term branching scenario is, is oftentimes thrown around. Now another key fact to remember about immersive learning simulations and therefore micro-learning simulations is that it has to teach. That seems obvious. It's an immersive learning simulation. But it's amazing how oftentimes when you're faced with the creativity and the challenges of creating immersive learning simulations, that's forgotten. Oftentimes it takes a back seat. We always strive at every decision point stage to tie it back to at least one learning objective. So that ensures that we're constantly moving that ball forward to the overall learning goal. All right? Another thing to keep in mind is all of the examples that we're going to use and work through during this little session here, they're all social. Basically what we're doing is we're simulating a dialogue. Um, but don't think that's the only thing that you can simulate with branching scenarios. You can simulate anything. It's physical simulations, software simulations, process simulations. It's just social simulations, dialogue simulations are easy to group like this because they're easy to understand, they're easy to model. We all understand how a conversation works. But if you wanted to simulate, say, a piece of machinery, you know, your decision point stage, instead of being a list of dialogue choices, it might be an array of buttons and switches. Depending upon which button you push or switch you flip, well, then the agent response stage is that machine responding accordingly. Okay? Next. Data supporting ILS effectiveness. I know a lot of us buy into this. Most of us wouldn't be here if we didn't. But just a few highlights here. Of those members who have created immersive learning simulations, ILS, that have been in place long enough to measure, 82% believe they have received a modest or very good return on investment. Of those members that have created immersive learning simulations, 97% believe that immersive learning simulations are better than other forms of rich skill practice. Of the respondents that have implemented ILS, 95% indicate that it is somewhat better or much better than other forms of rich skill practice. And last, simply put, they are the most effective and efficient practice out there. Their deep immersion provides the key to significant skill set change. I took these off the e-learning build site. And so this is all great. And for those of us that have deployed immersive learning simulations, uh, we believe it's true. Now, so the problem is, what's with the awkwardness? Why is there that awkwardness between mobile and immersive learning simulations if all this is so good? Like I said, a lot of it comes down to, I think, the student's expectation of what learning should be. When you think about immersive learning simulations, you want to schedule seat time because oftentimes they're long. In order to get through a simulation, you need 45 minutes, an hour. Schedule seat time. You need screen real estate. A lot of times you've got a view on, you've got decision points, you've got media. Speaking of media, a lot of times you need to have a little bit more horsepower with what you're playing these things on. So you need a little bit better hardware ability. And just development time. A lot of times things that you put on mobile devices are developed by simply shooting, clicking, recording. It's out there. You know, ILS, let's you know, be frank, I mean, they can take longer than the PowerPoint. You know, so uh, all of these ideas are not necessarily, you know, they don't work well, like I said, with mobile development, mobile delivery, where terms like just-in-time and augmentation are used. But what we need to remember is we're not talking about immersive learning simulations in the traditional sense, we're talking about micro-learning simulations, okay, which is a subset of immersive learning simulations. And you're going to learn more about those as we actually create them. But first, let's actually talk about speaking up. Getting ahead of myself first, let's have another opportunity to win a great prize. So, going through the challenge, on an average, how many cell phones are activated each minute? When I say activated, I mean turned on for the first time, like, uh, Subscription is started. 20,000. 20,000. 40,000. 40,000. 100,000. 793. Is the closest <laughs> so far, so. <laughs> <laughs> 1,000. Oh, wow. 1,000 every minute are activated for the first time. And so every minute, it's a brand new cell phone. In the US. Worldwide or in the US? Worldwide. Oh yeah, and by the way, I got all this information from Wikipedia. So before you go quoting it, go it at the next cocktail party or something, you might want to double check. All right. So you get to choose from. I have a four gig, four gig MP3 uh, audio player, or the fifteen dollar App Store gift card. Wow. Yeah. App Store gift card. All right. 
Let's talk about space learning, and I know that uh, Dr. Talheimer and uh, Ken both had slides that, that related to this, but let's talk about it a little bit more. Uh, the basic idea here is that retention is increased if you alternate small practice sessions with segments of time not engaged in practice. Let's look at that graph that Ken showed earlier. Let's spend just a little bit more time with it. First, let's look at the red line. The red line represents the traditional learning session, a learning event. So as we know, over a short amount of time, a lot of learning occurs. After the learning event is done, which is represented by this black line, retention dramatically decreases. Get out of the way here. Not all is lost. We've got a little bit left. So we're left with a little bit. But now let's look at the green line, which represents spaced learning. Each one of these nodes is a practice session. <laughs> Space by time. Now, at the end of the same learning event time frame here, it ends at the same event, at the same time, after the learning event is done, you see the retention is dramatically increased from traditional. But here's where it gets really interesting. If you go back and you space reminder sessions, practice sessions, after the event is done, you maintain that retention. So, how does this relate to our equation that we're talking about? Well, each one of these practice sessions, well, at their heart, I mean, immersive learning simulations are a great way to practice. They're a wonderful way to practice. Now, a few years ago, it didn't make sense because, you know, if you were going to try and schedule 10, 10 minute simulations at a desktop, you know, over a period of a week, well, we just don't work that way. You know, there's, it just wouldn't fit our work style. Nobody would get anything done other than, you know, space learning. So when you bring in mobile devices and the inherent convenience that they bring, then you've got something that starts to become pretty compelling, something that you can actually use. All right? And if we think back to those use cases, those fictional use cases, all of those people took their simulations, but it was convenient for them. They were given a time frame. It was after a traditional learning event or a long-form learning event. OK? Oh, this one came pretty quick. They're coming rapid fire now. All right, you ready? What was the name of Apple's first tablet computer? Newton. Who said Newton first over here? Go ahead. Full, long name is actually the Newton Message Pad 100. So you can tell me, they actually kept the pad in the name of what, what it's doing. Okay, docking station, four gig MP3 player. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So our final term in our component in our components is the micro learning simulation. Now we're going to what this is just by going through an exercise of making a, a fictional silly one. There's two ways that you're going to approach making your micro learning simulations. You're either going to just sit down and create them from scratch, maybe create a series of these individual micro learning simulations, or you are going to create a traditional immersive learning simulation, and then you're going to pull the micro learning simulations out of it. I like the second option because you've got your, you know, your full run simulation here, but you leverage it in other ways. So you can use it in a variety of ways. It's a much more efficient way to develop, I think. So we're going to focus on this for our little fictional exercise because also I think that if you know how to do this one, you're going to know how to do this one. If you can pull them out of the simulation, you'll be able to make them on their own, okay? So like I said, we have a silly little exercise. I'm going to walk you through how to create these micro-learning simulations. And it's going to be easy for you to remember how to make micro-learning simulations because you just have to step through the acronym MOBA. Okay? And each one of these letters stands for a step in the creation. First, make objectives. O, order the objectives. B, build scenario outlines. I, include lean dialogue. <coughs> L, leverage scenes as NLS. And last, E, enhance MLS with intros and outros. So for our example today, we are going to pretend that we are going to create a simulation where we want to teach people how to be a 10-year-old. I figure we've all been 10 years old at some point or another, and uh, many of us maybe have had children that have been 10 years old, so we can all be our subject matter experts, okay? So like any e-learning or learning project, we want to start where we should start, and that is we need to make objectives. An M, in the moment. So our objectives for teaching people how to be a 10-year-old might be something along the lines of use plausible excuses to stay up late, identify ways to maximize Xbox time, and identify ways to convince a parent to permit an unconventional breakfast. Okay? 
So we have our learning objectives. We feel that if people can demonstrate the ability to do these three things, they can be a 10-year-old. Pretty much encompasses it. Okay, so we've made our objectives. We go into our next step. We, oh, we want to order our objectives. Oftentimes, you'll be able to order your objectives chronologically. <clears throat> but you just want to pick some way to order them that makes sense. If the student were to go through them linearly, what makes sense? Like I said, most of the time you'll find chronological approach works. So let's go ahead and order these. So I think we probably want to start with the breakfast one, obviously, maybe the Xbox time in the middle, and then the last one being to stay up late. So that would chronologically order it for us. Next point in our acronym would be B, which is build scenario outlines. It's easy. All we do is we label them scene one, two, and three. Built our scenario outlines. Now we can go one step further and we can jot down some ideas on what we want our decision points to be for those learning objectives. Maybe scene one, identify ways to convince a parent to permit an unconventional breakfast might be decision point one. How could you convince your mom to let you eat pizza? Decision point two, go for the gold. How could you convince your mom to let you eat pizza wrapped around a donut? <laughs> scene two, identify ways to maximize Xbox time. Decision point one, how can you convince your mom that Xbox would be a better afternoon activity than chores? Decision point two, go for the goal. How can you convince your mom that you need an extra hour of Xbox time? And the third one, use plausible excuses to stay up late. Decision point one, how can you convince your mom to let you stay up late? Decision point two, go for the goal. How can you convince her to let you stay up late and watch TV? All right, so we have now built our scenario outlines. And what this is doing for us what this is doing for us is first, it's creating a simulation that teaches our students the desired learning objectives. So that's just our traditional immersive learning simulation. But second, it creates a simulation that could be a coherent whole, and it can be broken into the micro learning simulations. We're creating a modularity of about it, you know? So next acronym letter, I. Include lean dialogue. Look for ways to edit your dialogue down. Dialogue meaning dialogue from the agent. If you're making media, if you've got a cartoon bubble out, make it shorter. Two, keep the dialogue to exactly what's necessary to get content and draw it across to the learner. This is going to help us in two different ways. First off, it's screen real estate, that problem for mobile that we've identified that if you're developing for mobile, it's going to bite you. It's just hard to develop. Even iPads can be difficult sometimes, although they're a lot better than a phone. But anyway, it's going to, your decision points are going to be smaller, they're going to fit on there easier. And also, if you're creating media, it's going to make your media much shorter and much easier bandwidth-wise, processor-wise. It's going to help you in a number of ways. So just as a quick example, let's say that we write a decision point as we're mapping out our simulation, hopefully in similar letter. Plug, product, plug, placement. <laughs> Uh, Mom, I was thinking, and wouldn't you agree that eating both the pizza and the donuts for breakfast would be better than letting them both go stale? Because if they go stale, we will just need to throw them away. And I know how you feel about letting good food go to waste. <laughs> so, you know, that's a great decision point, but that would take up our entire screen. It would take a while to read it, which is not in the mobile frame of mind. So let's edit it down. Mom, I think eating both the pizza and donuts would be better than letting them go to waste. Just make them short. All right? I, L, leverage scenes as MLS. We've now mapped them out. We've included lean dialogue. We have our learning objectives. We've created scenario outlines. So now what we want to do is we want to go in and we want to pull out these modules as their individual components. Now, if you're using SimWriter, product placement plug once again, if there's a feature that allows you to do that automatically, very cleanly, easily. But if you're using something like Flash or something like that, and you want to copy that out of your timeline, you want to make a scene, this is the point that you want to do that because you've created everything you can as the traditional. Now it's time to make your micro learning objects. All right? So that brings us to our last acronym letter E, enhance MLS with intros and outros. <clears throat> when you pull these out, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of backstory to it. You know, and there's oftentimes there's a story that unfolds after. So you want to give them a little bit of bearing. You want to orient them before you just drop them into the scenario. So a lot of times you're going to need to write something. What's maybe preceded, you know, their interaction within simulation and perhaps the learning objectives. And then on the other end, after they're done, maybe you want to give them a report, some feedback, and, and perhaps you even want to tell them, like I said, how the story unfolds after they've left the simulation. Okay. Example for this one. Let's say we pull out the Xbox one. We're just working with the Xbox one. It's after you're outside and there's nothing to do. Your mom has just requested that you complete your chores. How can you convince your mom that the Xbox would be a better activity than chores? Even better, <clears throat> excuse me, how can you convince her to let you play the Xbox for an extra hour? 
So we've given them some bearings, some orientation. So we've gone through our acronym model, followed each one. We now have our individual microlearning simulations. So just to carry out the silly example to its full extent, because we knew you'd want to see it, we went ahead and created it real quick. So we start with enhancing with intro and outros. So our intro that we wrote. Audio on? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, she said that. If you're so bored, why don't you finish your chores? Decision point. That's a great idea, Mom. I'll certainly do my chores. However, I think I should probably play the Xbox first. Or can I please play Xbox before chores? Or, no fair. I want to play Xbox first. So which one do we want to choose? First one. That's a hard one. Why do you think you should play Xbox first? Getting my Xbox allow me to fully concentrate on my chores. I think an hour of Xbox time should suffice. I really don't have a good reason. I just want to play Xbox first. Hey. <laughs> and because I like Xbox and I don't like chores. Hey. Hey. Three. <laughs> sure. Why not? Finish your chores and then you can play Xbox. Okay. So we finished our short little micro learning simulation. You've demonstrated that you have room for improvement. Please try the simulation. So I'm just kind of finishing it out, having some fun. All right. So we know how to create the micro learning simulations. Um, Dean, like you said, now I think we're going to take a look at uh, an actual. Sorry. <laughs> now we're going, take, we're going to take a look at that Harvard simulation that we had up earlier. And Dean is going to open that up in SimWriter, and he is going to quickly carve out a micro learning simulation, and he's going to publish it to the iPad. Okay, I don't have a microphone, so I'll just speak up. Hopefully you can hear me. So the, de the example that we demonstrated a little bit ago is now open in SimWriter. And you'll notice, I can click through, you'll notice in the map and, and the design tab, there's a lot going on in this simulation. It was a, um, approximately an hour long course, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but we planned it um, using uh, that strategy where we, we wanted to make it so we could pull out those micro <coughs> simulations. So what I've done here is I've picked an area that we kind of have predetermined would be a good spot uh, to select for a microlearning simulation. And holding down a couple quick keys, you can quickly and easily select stages, um, target stages that you want to put into your microlearning simulation. And you've defined those with your acronym. You've made your learning objectives before this. Uh, with a couple clicks, we're going to create a new learning object, so we're going to call this Micro Learning Sim Harvard example. And now this is where you have some choices. So you have to decide are you publishing for iPhone, iPad, or both. And uh, you know, uh, you take some tips from the cooking show in these kind of situations. Um, so you want to uh, kind of make it work for your example here a little bit. So I'm, rather than create new templates on the fly, um, I'll go for an iPad output so uh, that fits the, the format pretty closely. And so you have some options here of what you can do uh, with sizing, using the existing size or custom sizes. And then um, it says, what do you do want to do with the link template stages? Now what this means is it gives you options for um, if you want to update the course and have your micro learning simulations automatically updated going forward, um, that's where this is important. Or if you want to just duplicate it and make it kind of standalone. So now if you update the course, this is standalone. And what that would allow you to do is change the content. So you could have it in the course, one way and have a little bit different options and distractors and things like that actually in your micro learning simulation. So you can do it either way. In this case, I'll just choose uh, duplicate. And it says, okay, I've created it. Now I've put it into your own topic. Now, if you look on the, the map tab, what it actually has done is created, instead of a topic one, learning uh, object one. And it's a different color. So SimWriter's just giving you a visual clue and indicator that you've created a, a micro learning uh, object. And um, so I can continue developing now, following the mobile acronym, create intros and outros. So to save a little bit of time, um, I've gone in and uh, we'll pull this out of the oven. We have a freshly designed slide <laughs> for the intro. And uh, so all we've done is we've created kind of just a, a basic intro slide where we could put a text box uh, for the background information. And you could do the same thing for the outro where you could have a guide, you know, come on in and talk. But basically just some simple enhancements 
um, uh, to prep this for your output. The next step would be, after you get it prepped, uh, and you go into your build settings, and this is in, in SimRider where you would select flash-based courseware, which is the traditional option, but now there's the iPhone, iPad application um, option as well. And uh, now Apple um, requires that you have an Apple developer ID, I think it's like cost $99 to register for that, and you have to have a certificate number uh, before you can actually publish these on your computer. So Apple, a couple little things that make you do. So those are, those are things that you have to factor in here in your development. Um, but basically what it's asking you is just some, some output um, options before you put this on and saying you want to do this on an iPad or iPhone or both. Um, you have some options depending on how graphic intensive it is, how do you want it handled, you want it handled by um, the, the CPU or the graphics uh, processing unit. The default is uh, auto there. Um, high resolution or standard. And then, of course, a landscape or portrait, or you can have it auto rotate. So there's just some basic things that, you know, uh, because of the, um, the built in features of the iPad and the iPhone, uh, you have some options there. Now, once again, to kind of save a few minutes here, you hit publish. If you have your certificate information in, your developer information in, um, you hit OK, and it will process for a few minutes and create your app. And then you have choices on how you would deploy that. You could put that in iTunes and, and download it on your phone by you know, syncing like you normally would. Or you could have a little bit more elaborate way. If you have many users, you could send out an email with a link to that app. And then when a user would open that up on their iPad, they would click to download that and could install that way. So you have options. Um, I believe you know, going forward, Apple is going to kind of keep you know, evolving that process. It'll probably be easier and easier going forward even to, to get them on your, on your devices. So that being said, if we go through the publishing process, now this Brandon has this little iPad out here. So yeah, this is truly technical. There's a simulation that we went through this the other day. So it's the iPad. It's more forgiving as far as screen real estate. Um, if you were going to do this for the iPhone, you would want to make some graphical UI considerations. SimRider, by the way, has a way to create uh, simulations one time and apply different graphical and layout standards to that, so you can quickly switch between them. I would suggest doing that. Is this Pro or Simplicity? That's Pro. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think uh, if you want to flip back the presentation, there's one last chance to win a fantastic prize. Seventeen. Seventeen. <laughs> That's amazing. That is amazing. Well done. All right, so we'll get to it real quick. Um, that's all right. We'll go through this sim again. I know you all want to see it one more time, so we're so proud of it. <laughs> It's, it's Morris Cone from somewhere. Is there a phone by the speaker? Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably. Yeah, pull it away. Hey! Oh. 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 Alright, okay, so let's go forward to the next. Now this, you need to name the band and the song. Ooh. Band and oh. the song. Oh. Audio. Does it sound well? Yeah. You ready? Thank you very much.